uh, just tell me if it's uh, uh, if you can't hear me. So. streamed live to the whole world, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is really a really around the world uh, talk today. Um, yes, fantastic that came, there's so many people uh, turned up today. Um, yeah, uh, something about my, myself first, uh, um, I, I come, come originally from England, I was born in southern England, uh, uh, I, I, I studied in Scotland and uh, I moved gradually more further and further north, and uh, when I was in Scotland, I got uh, I started getting interested in uh, in vegetable growing. When I was a student, I had a small garden, um, and uh, uh, in 1981, I started looking for jobs. And there was uh, there were no jobs in the UK at the time. There was somebody called Maggie Thatcher who was closing all the research <laughs> institutes. So I, I call myself a political refugee. Um, so I moved to Norway in, uh, as I say, in 1981. Uh, very quickly got a job here because of the mainly because of the boom in the oil industry in the 70s. There was uh, I was qualified as a actually as a, an oceanographer. I specialised in ocean waves. I have nothing at all to do with plants in my education. In fact, I gave up biology when I was 15 because I didn't like uh, cutting up rats in the classroom. Um, so. Uh, Absolutely no, I'm totally unqualified for this. This is all just uh, hands-on stuff. I'm a gardener. Um, yeah, so I came to, to Norway in 1981. In the late 70s, I got caught up in the, in the, the kind of green wave in, uh, um, in, in the UK. And uh, as I say, I started growing my own vegetables. I became a vegetarian. And uh, then I moved to Norway which is a big shock for me because uh, I moved to a country where it seemed that vegetables were illegal. <laughs> <laughs> there really were no more than four or five vegetables in the supermarket. People <laughs> told me that uh, the reason for this was it, it was so damn cold in uh, Trundelag, where I've lived all my, all my life uh, since then. Um, yeah, and I think I've disproved that now because uh, today in my garden I have over 2,000 different uh, edible plants. Um, so there's no, and in fact I believe where I live in, in my part of the world, we have perfect conditions for growing vegetables. There's nowhere else in the world that's better than Trindelag. <laughs> it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's never, there's never drought, you know, perfect. Yeah. Do you believe me? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. How, but, big, uh, how big is your plot? Uh, my plot is, uh, you know, it's about 40 by 50 meters. It's not huge. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I don't have many of each plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very intensive. Yeah. Um, but uh, we shouldn't just, uh, you can't just copy what the rest of the world does. And uh, think that you could start growing chilies and, and tomatoes and things like that. Because that doesn't go. But there are thousands of other plants, potential plants that you can grow. Not 
climate. Uh, we're talking about that, that today. Um, you perhaps uh, noticed I've got some letters after my name. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, we like to have lots of letters after our name. The Fellow of the Royal Society of blah, 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 PhD or whatever. Um, ESM, know, anybody know what that stands for? I know one person who does because she was in Harmer yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it stands for Extreme Salad Man. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, some years ago, 13 years ago, in 2003, I set the world record in uh, salad making. They're so making a salad with 538 different ethnic parts in one salad bowl. Yeah, absolutely crazy, but uh, why did I do it? Because well, I could do it, you know, basically. It was a gimmick to attract attention to them. Uh, I was part of the uh, Organic Gardening Network in Norway at the time. And we, we had an annual open day, and uh, to uh, uh, attract attention to the event, we decided to advertise we would break the world record in salad making. Yeah. Do you need a book of records? It's not in the Guinness Book of Records, not for yet. one reason. <laughs> they uh, refused to take it because they didn't have a category for this. <laughs> um, and I, I'm quite glad that I, I, I didn't, uh, didn't get in there, because okay. uh, at the time it was all about records, <coughs> how fat and how big, etc. It wasn't to do with diversity and organic things, ecological things. Um, so I, uh, I kind of joked for a number of years, we really need, you know, Guinness is a brewery, <coughs> originally. Yes. Uh, we really need an organic brewery that's uh, interested in putting out a, a record book for <laughs> meaningful records, yes. not, for, you know, not everything to do with greed, etc. Okay, so a little introduction. Um, yeah, I usually show this to my audience. Uh, I travel quite a lot around the world talking, and not many people know where Trondheim is. I live in a little place called Malvik, which is uh, um, about uh, 18 kilometers north of Trondheim, or uh, next to the Trondheim Fjord. Trondheim Fjord. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a bit surprising that probably the the largest collection of edible plants in the world is uh, to be found at 64 and a half degrees north, and it always surprises people. And uh, hopefully, I'll, you'll understand a bit more about uh, how this is possible as, as, we, as we proceed. It's not just that I'm, uh, I'm a collect, collector man manic, collector mania, or summer money. Put in yeah. <laughs> um, my dad collects stamps, so I had to find something to collect, um, it's in my genes, and it uh, ended up being edible plants. So, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, something about uh, the inspirations I, I had on, on the way. I, I, um, as I say, I moved to Norway. People told me it was difficult to grow vegetables where I was. And in, um, actually in the same year that I moved to Norway, in in uh, 1981, um, there was formed a local group of the Norwegian Useful Plant Society, Nutevext Föreningen, uh, in Trondheim, so Lokal Laget. And uh, this guy here, Jan Erik Hofold, is a bit of a hero of mine. He's uh, been in the, um, on, the, on the board, on the steering committee of, uh, of the local group uh, right the way from the beginning in the early 1980s. And uh, I remember the first spring I was out on a, a foraging tour um, down on the beach near my house. And uh, I very quickly learned that there were something like uh, 60 wild edible plants just in the local area where I live. A huge diversity of, uh, of food plants. Um, not all were good to eat. Some of them were really in the emergency food category. <laughs> um, you'd be, have to be absolutely desperate to try. But uh, all these plants have been used uh, over the years in different parts of the world. Yeah. Um, so this was a kind of, a, it, was, it was really strange because the supermarkets had nothing. And then there was this group of, uh, at the time, 20 year olds who had also been inspired by um, alternative thinking in the 1970s, uh, all in their 20s, and they'd started up this local group, and uh, they were eating a huge array of different uh, vegetables. So it was a huge contrast, of course, berries and 
and mushrooms as well in the autumn. Yeah. How you say you plant sixty different types quickly? How does that compare with Scotland? Oh yeah, probably about the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Scotland. You from Scotland? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Oh, <laughs> compared to where I came. Well, I knew very little about. Uh, I was kind of beginning when I was a student in Scotland, so I did mostly gardening and started learning the wild plants. But I didn't know. I knew the wild mushrooms, some of a few, but not uh, not uh, edible greens. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm, I'm basically I've worked as an oceanographer. I actually gave in my resignation at work. Uh, oh, this is going live. I don't think many of my work colleagues know this, but uh, <laughs> I gave my resignation in a couple of days ago, and I will uh, become a, a pensioner, the inverted commas, at the end of April, um, to work 100% with plants. So this is quite uh, quite fun for me. Um, yeah. And uh, the, um, yeah, as I, I actually worked, uh, I worked as an oceanographer, and as I say, with ocean waves, and in the late uh, 1980s, uh, early 1990s, uh, we had a, 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 an amazing project where we were mapping the wave energy resources of the South Pacific Islands from Trondheim. Yeah, it was a NORAD uh, finance project. Um, the idea of uh, replacing diesel uh, fuel for, um, for energy in the South Pacific Islands with energy from the waves. Because at that time, the uh, uh, Norwegian uh, or the um, uh, CINTEF and uh, the University of Trondheim were world leaders in the technology for extracting energy from the waves. Um, and this entailed, uh, um, we did uh, measurements of the waves with the uh, ocean going <coughs> moored buoys that moored in the ocean and go up and down and, and measured the waves. And uh, I, was, uh, I was working mainly, um, I was giving courses on ocean wave energy together with the professor at the University in Trondheim um, in various uh, islands in the South Pacific. So I, I usually had to go down to Fiji and the Cook Islands and places like this, uh, usually in November. I was thinking of leaving Trondheim in November. You know, how disgusting. disgusting. Yeah, how disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I did it. And uh, in the process, of course, I had to travel around the world. and. Uh, as I, I was already inspired by local um, foraging traditions, I started buying books on foraging traditions in other parts of the world, wondering you know, what other plants could be possibly grown in where I live. And one book was a big inspiration. I remember buying in Seattle um, on a tour to the South, on a stopover, with this book here, Spirit of Lance, Edible Plants of the World. It's uh, a book which uh, was put together, or a database that was put together by an American professor between 1870 and 1920 and it was published after his death and it's basically massive information no, no pictures just masses of information on how almost 3,000 different species of uh, edible plants are used around the world and I started looking in this book and I found uh, to my surprise that uh, there were actually many of the plants that I already had in my garden which were, I was growing as ornamentals were actually food um, and uh, we'll, we'll see some examples of that fairly soon. Um, but I started going through this book and crossing off what well, that could be interesting to try and that could be interesting to try, etc. Yeah. What's edible? What is edible? Species. Speciesly. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, another database which uh, um, was actually put together by a guy called Ken Fern, who was a bus driver in London. Um, he got fed up with uh, driving buses and he moved out into the country and uh, he got really um, inspired, again, similar to me, with uh, um, the world's uh, foraging traditions. And uh, um, he went even further, he was much worse than me, and <laughs> he uh, put together this database in the early 1990s with over 7,000 plants. Um, not only the edibility, everything you can do with these plants. So, so you use for dyeing, for medicine, etc., etc. And this database is still freely available on the on the internet, for, so you can just seek uh, information on on these on these plants. And I, I guess I'm probably the biggest user of that over the years. <laughs> because I, 
in 1992, he sent me the entire database on 10 of these old diskettes. Um, and he didn't want any money for it either, you know. Um, I supported his charity after, afterwards, but uh, yeah, he was an amazing, amazing guy, he still is. Um, but the, my real, uh, um, my Bible, incredible plants, I always have it with me, wherever I am, <laughs> is uh, this book here, Cornucopia 2, a source book of edible plants. Um, and as you can see, I've worn out one completely. Um, it's not that easy to get hold of, unfortunately. Um, but um, Amazon had uh, 20 whole brand new copies available two, three years ago. So I was one of the lucky ones that got, got those. Um, and no, actually, it did come out. It did come out. It was um, republished in, in North America, but you, you could only be bought in North America. Not outside. So you couldn't know somebody over there to get it. Anyway, um, as, you, as you can see, it's just uh, masses of information of uh, the world's edifice. Real fascinating stuff. So when I was learning about this stuff, you know, I take it to bed with me. And, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, as, as I was, I, I was traveling quite a lot, I often would go to botanical gardens, and this is how I learned the plants. I went around botanical gardens with my book here, saw the label, looked it up, and, and then, <laughs> so this happened over, you know, this was over several years, and uh, um, within this book here, um, in, the, in the introduction it says that, uh, this is in Norwegian here, but I, I'll translate it into English, um, it says, uh, of the world's 15,000 edible plant species, there are only around about 150 which are uh, cultivated commercially, so there's very, actually very few. Um, and uh, most of them are actually perennials. They're not uh, um, annuals. Most of our, or annuals are bottled by annuals. Most of our conventional vegetables fall into that category. Um, in actual fact, uh, he was way off the mark here. There, according to my current estimates, I think there are something like 100,000 edible plants in the world. A huge number. Maybe one third of all the species in the world been used for food at some stage. Um, and uh, from my point of view, living in Trondheim, there's been a, uh, a massive increase in the availability of vegetables in the, in the supermarkets. So maybe I can buy 30 now if, if I ever went to a supermarket. Of course, I don't need to. But, uh, um, so there's maybe 30 now. But probably on a, on a global basis, in that same 30-year period from when I moved to Trondheim to now, um, there's actually been a decrease in the number of vegetables which have been um, which are grown commercially on a big scale, but it's the same the same species which are sold globally anytime anywhere. Okay, so asparagus, for an example, which to me is a it's a spring vegetable. Asparagus, the name asparagus means spring shoot. Okay. Um, but nowadays we can buy asparagus anytime, practically anywhere, because it's produced on a big scale in Peru, China. It's all, all part of this global um, system that we have today. Um, and that's a great show. Um, I think it's uh, very much underestimated the uh, seasonality of food in our diets. Yeah, that's very, very important for us also mentally. It's something to look forward to in the spring. You know? um, so, uh, yeah, there are positive developments, but in the, maybe in the last few years there's been a positive upswing again, thanks to the farmers' markets and, and small-scale local production again, and some old vegetables coming back again. Um, yeah, so that was that. <coughs> and uh, around about so. Yeah, about 10 years ago now, um, well, 15 years ago, I started writing articles based on my, um, my, tr my trial and experiences with uh, growing many of these plants in my own garden in uh, Malbec, outside of Trondheim, and uh, that's actually a view from my, from my garden over the Trondheim Fjord, uh, just to give you a kind of a lo lo location. And, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, so, um, 
what was I going to say? Um, 15, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 15, 20, 15 years ago, I started writing articles for the um, for Sopelnuta Vexter, which is the magazine of the Norwegian Newsports Plant Society, on some of the more exciting um, plants that I, I kind of discovered, which were fairly unknown in Norway at the time. Um, and uh, after that, about 10 years ago, I started writing in English for the uh, for Permaculture magazine in the UK. And uh, I started writing, I wrote three or four articles about uh, some of my favorite perennial vegetables. And uh, they, uh, they then asked me whether I was maybe interested in writing a book. With, uh, so I've written three or four profiles of, of plants. And uh, would you be interested in writing a book? And uh, actually at the time I was already started doing, doing talks. And, uh, um, and I called actually, my, I was calling my talks around the world in 80 species, uh, edible plants. And uh, uh, the first one was uh, about, about 10 years ago, the Norwegian Botanical Society in Trondheim. Um, so I said, uh, I already had the thought myself that maybe it would be fun to, to write a book about this. And uh, so I said yes. It took me a long time to write because I had a full time job and I was doing it in the evenings. So it took about six years to do. But it finally came out uh, three years ago around the world in 80 plants. Um, and uh, the book and also the talk, um, the talks that I do on this subject, um, are basically journeys around the world looking, um, looking at uh, my 80 favorite perennial vegetables, which uh, I grow in my garden in, uh, outside of Trondheim. And uh, basically each, there are 80 plant profiles, and each one I cover the, uh, um, the history behind the plants, how they were used locally and where they originate, um, how you would grow them, and how mm. you would use them in the, uh, in the kitchen. Mm. Um, in actual fact, there are probably several hundred plants which are mentioned in the book, but there are 80, 80 main ones. And uh, in the book, the journey starts in London and ends in London, of course, with the around the world in 80 concept. Um, but today, um, and also yesterday, uh, I'm starting in Japan because that's an area that uh, I'm really fascinated about at the moment. There are still probably a thousand different edible plants that I haven't tried that come from Japan. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start today in, in Japan. Um, we're going to fly across the, uh, um, the uh, Pacific to, to South America, North America, and across to Scandinavia, down through Central Europe, from the Mediterranean countries to the Caucasus, to the Himalaya, and uh, finally ended up ending up in uh, Siberia again. Okay? Um, so, but first of all, something about uh, these perennial vegetables. Again, the slide is in Norwegian, but I'll, I'll translate it into English as we go along. Um, why do I think that uh, we should be growing more perennials today? Um, there are various reasons. Traditionally, one would use, uh, I mean, the, um, the wild foraged vegetables that we, uh, that we um, harvest in the springtime. Um, plants like, uh, like nettles, nestle, uh, squalacold, god forbid, or uh, ground elder in English. Um, they are all perennial plants, right? And we harvest them in the springtime. So it's the kind of opposite to the, to the traditional vegetables that we're harvest in the autumn. Um, and uh, traditionally this uh, spring harvest would complement the traditional vegetables. Um, in Norwegian, I turn things around and I, you know, it just doesn't make sense in English, but so we talk, I talk about not in husting, I talk about in voring. <laughs> if you say it enough times, then uh, it actually um, begins to sit. It sounds a bit funny to start with, but uh, in Vorida Grand Sake. Anyway, um, other reasons for growing perennials is that uh, if you think about it, the, the nettles and the ground elder or the spring harvested forage vegetables, they're an, 
they're perfect. There's no insect, insect holes or anything like that. So there are fewer because there are fewer insects and other um, like uh, fungi attacks and this kind of thing in the springtime. Less. Uh, snails and slugs and this kind of thing. So the spring harvest is, uh, so it's much easier to grow these perennials organically. Okay? Many of us, uh, um, I can say now, many of us have, have big problems with growing brassicas, for example, the cabbage family, because of this. Remember last year we had this massive uh, attack of the uh, cool mode or diamondback, diamondback moth, um, which uh, caused huge problems and is causing bigger and bigger problems. But actually, the, the kale, the cabbage family, was originally perennial and was harvested in the springtime. And we'll come back to that later because we can still change things around and grow kales for spring harvest rather than um, autumn harvest. Um, another thing is there's uh, less need for irrigation or water for these perennials because their active growth, growth period is from very early spring, April to midsummer. In that period, after after the winter season, there's usually enough water in the in the soils. So there's no drought problems. There's less need for um, for fertilizer because the roots of the perennials they they go much deeper and they're much more efficient at uh, sucking up the available uh, nutrients in the soil. Many of my um, best perennials actually never get any fertilizer at all. They just get what nature brings. Um, another very important thing that it's, uh, it's less work. It's like the ultimate no dig garden again. <laughs> because the plants just come back of, them, of themselves year after year after year. And that's very important in a, in a future where we're seeing climate change and there's not going to be as much oil in the future. It's much better, it makes much more sense to grow, grow perennials in, a, in a, um, an era with less energy available, um, at least to me. And uh, what else can we say? So actually, um, back, back to climate again, um, most of these uh, of perennials generally are much more robust against climate change as well. With climate change, we're seeing these large swings in the climate. So one year you might get really cold weather. Two years ago we had uh, the coldest spring ever in, in, uh, in, in my part of the world, in Trimbalai. Um, the farmers had big problems to come out and sow and plant right the way up to midsummer. I had the biggest yields ever in my garden and my perennials at the same time. So it's the, total, it's the complete opposite. And if a perennial, if suddenly there's a cold period comes or a really bad weather, the perennials just stop and wait until the good weather comes. So you still get a yield, just a bit later. So they're much, much less sensitive to climate change. Um, many of the species that uh, I'll be talking about today, they, they actually grow best in, in woodland, in shady conditions. Most of our traditional vegetables grow in, we grow in out in, right out in the sun, in but uh, actually, many or most plants originated in, in, in woodland conditions. So they actually could be planted in places where you wouldn't dream today of growing vegetables, like on the north side of your house. Mm -hmm. um, and here we get into the concept that's very, become very popular within permaculture or forest gardening, school targeting. Uh, I'll show you a slide about that in a minute. Um, yeah, another thing is that many of the plants that, uh, many of these perennials, they actually double as, as uh, ornamental plants. So you can actually take the, the first leaves that spring out in the springtime for food, and they'll re-sprout, and they'll still flower in the same season. Mm -hmm. So actually many of the ornamentals that you grow in your gardens are actually edible plants, and we'll see various examples of that as we go along. And here I had to introduce the concept of edimentals, which stands for edible ornamentals, or in Norwegian, crude sakka, crude green sakka. So this combination I'm particularly fond of, um, <laughs> and trying to persuade uh, ornamental gardeners that uh, it's very easy for them to change to edible gardening because they've already got half of their, or third of their plants are, are edible. 
Uh, another thing is that it uh, is turning out more and more that uh, these perennials um, actually have a higher um, uh, nutrient um, content compared to uh, traditional ones, and particularly wild foraged plants. We see um, quite a few analyses showing that uh, the uh, nutrient content is higher than uh, um, the uh, vegetables we buy in the supermarket. Also related to climate is uh, less erosion, your top has decreased. Um, we can actually increase uh, some perennials you can, you can harvest over most of the summer, but other ones are, have a very intensive uh, um, uh, collection season early in the spring. Um, and to increase, to in increase the um, uh, harvesting season, you can actually move the roots indoors and, uh, and extend the season that way, force them indoors or in a greenhouse or whatever. Um, this is a practice which is uh, carried out worldwide, actually. And I think that uh, perennials are particularly advantageous in areas with short seasons. Um, and in, here I'm thinking in Norway, where most people that I speak to out, outside of Norway think that I've got a very short season, because within Norway we have uh, um, <coughs> go up into the, into the mountain villages or into northern Norway, they have very short seasons and, uh, and, and, and cold, cold conditions. And these kind of conditions are, are perfect for, for perennials um, because uh, they, they start growing very early in the springtime, okay? And they kind of uh, uh, use the available sun energy throughout the season in an optimal way. So co compared to traditional vegetables, which take quite some time before they start to uh, um, producing, perhaps it's uh, July before they really start getting big and start to uh, start growing. Um, the perennials are, are using the whole season and, and in that way we can actually get to uh, very high yields of uh, leafy green vegetables even in northern Norway and in, in the, um, in the uh, mountain villages. I think uh, uh, Angelica, Con, okay, huge plant. Tromso palma, Tromso palma. In English, but uh, it's a huge plant. Lots of, uh, you know, how, how, did, how does that happen? You know, I mean, how, yeah, you can do it, you know, but you have to choose uh, the right species. And in fact, Tromsa palma is an edible plant in Iran. It's a very important spring vegetable, and they also use the seeds as a spice. Um, until recently, they weren't aware of this in, uh, in Tromsa, but actually, they've got a huge food resource there, all over the city, um, where it's a, a, a naturalized plant. We'll maybe come back to that a bit later. Okay, so that was some of the justification for what I do. Um, and it's actually within the, uh, this whole thing about so using, yeah, and the, and the perennials, of course, they bind more carbon in the, in the soil compared to the traditional vegetables, which is also important. And it's even when within this, uh, so climatic advice from Norsk Lombrich <coughs> all evening, or the agricultural uh, um, <coughs> advice centre, or whatever they're called. Um, but uh, it's important for maintaining carbon in the soil to, uh, to have a ground cover. Of course, they're not talking about vegetables here, but it's this, exactly the same uh, uh, argument. You can, you can find that on the internet if you want to read more. I talked a little bit about uh, forest gardening, which is uh, um, uh, particularly inspiring uh, uh, these days to people, well, people who are inspired by permaculture, which I guess uh, many of you have heard of. Anybody here heard of permaculture? <laughs> yeah, quite a few, I think. And, uh, well, the original permaculture, anyway, was uh, um, in the original permaculture, which was mainly focused on agriculture and, 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 and growing food, um, one tried to uh, set up uh, um, systems which uh, replicated nature in some way. And one of the concepts within uh, permaculture is this uh, forest gardening, where instead of uh, creating a uh, traditional open vegetable plot in your garden, you uh, 
maybe make a, you make a kind of a small, or kind of like a young, edible forest. Um, we're composed of different layers. Uh, the highest up, you have uh, fruit trees and, uh, and nut trees. Then lower down, you may, you've got currant bushes, etc. Maybe on the su southern side of the, or the sunny side of the, the forest, you can, you can grow some of traditional vegetables as well. Um, but within the forest, you have shade-loving perennial edibles, um, some of which will climb up into the trees. And you'll see many of these uh, are um, in, 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 in my book, and also in the talk I'll come into as we go along. Um, yeah. There are very few today uh, um, recognized uh, uh, perennial vegetables. The one that uh, I've just uh, put a few up here, the most well-known, of course, is asparagus. Um, which, is, as I mentioned, just means spring shoot. And uh, along with that, uh, the other one we can often buy in supermarkets is uh, <coughs> artichoke which unlike most of the training vegetables I'm talking about, it's uh, not usually the spring shoots which are being used. You can actually use the spring shoots of artichokes as well as food, but uh, it's actually the, the um, receptacle of the flower, the lower part of the flower, which is the part that we eat. So that's uh, harvested a bit later in the season compared to the spring shoots. Um, nowadays, uh, um, artichokes are actually mainly grown annually in places like California where they've got such a climate that they can grow several crops on the same piece of land throughout the season. So they have new varieties of artichoke which uh, grow very quickly and they don't take the benefit of uh, the perenniality. And of course artichokes are not uh, terribly hardy um, but they were formerly um, <coughs> grown in, in Norway. There was, a, there was an old variety called Herodors, and there was a couple of others which were actually grown for the king uh, back uh, in the old days, um, mainly in uh, southern Norway. What? One of them's called Herodors. Yeah. It's also found in Denmark, and it's, sort of, it's becoming available again. Hmm. And I've also included uh, um, rhubarb, because uh, rhubarb, we think of it as a fruit, but it's only really been a fruit since sugar has become really popular. But, and rhubarb is, uh, okay, it, it is actually a perennial vegetable. If you go back and, and, uh, and see where, and, and, and look at the wild species, all the wild species of uh, rhubarb were harvested by local people for food. <coughs> and they was, it was used as a vegetable. Sugar wasn't available. They used it as a vegetable as, uh, in various dishes. It was also fermented, for example. Um, so originally, even in Europe, when rhubarb came to Europe first in the 16th century, it was, uh, it was used as a vegetable and a medicinal plant. So it's only in the last couple of hundred years we started using it to fill the hungry gap in the springtime of fruit. So when the fruit was um, gone from the storage, they, we went over to rhubarb in the springtime. Okay? I've also included uh, this picture here. Anybody know what this is? Picture of, it's a very common uh, peppered horseradish called mm -hmm. flower. Beautiful plant, an edimental mm -hmm. leaf, yeah. um, and fully uh, edible. And I've included it most uh, my <coughs> books mainly about uh, um, leafy green vegetables, but. Um, um, it's uh, main, uh, horseradish, of course, is ma mainly used for the, uh, it's mainly the, the, the roots which are used for pepper root, uh, for um, pepper root sauce in Norwegian and uh, horseradish sauce. Um, also, important ingredient in wasabi. Yeah. yeah. Fake. It is wasabi, yeah, fake, yeah. And, uh, but actually, in parts of Europe, it was also traditionally traditional to harvest the young shoots of horseradish as a vegetable. And the flowers are also really tasty. So try it. But don't eat a lot of them. They're quite strong, but mixed. They're excellent. OK, now we're, I should actually, <coughs> my, I haven't actually said, we're having a break at some time, Derek?
Ah, oh, decide. Okay, so I can keep them here. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Power. Um, okay, so um, now we're going to start on the journey and start looking at some of the plants. Now, as I mentioned, uh, um, actually last spring, I was on a study trip to uh, to Japan. It's an area that uh, really fascinates me because, uh, as I mentioned here, both in Japan, Korea, China, all these countries, foraging was, was a hugely important uh, tradition. Um, and in particular, Japan is one of the, the, the world's biodiversity hotspots. In other words, uh, in Japan there are over 2,000 endemic plants, plants that are only found in Japan. So there's a huge uh, number of uh, wild species there. And uh, the, these uh, traditions for, um, for um, foraging in Japan, it's, these, these vegetables are called sansai, and in, uh, uh, in Korea they're called samuru, shunamu, which uh, literally means uh, mountain vegetables, so vegetables that were taken down from the mountain. And uh, these days, uh, um, you know, people have moved from the mountain villages into the cities, the cities are getting bigger and bigger, and of course the people, they, they remember that, that fantastic food they had in the mountain villages, and particularly the wild foraged food that they had in the springtime. So there's a market for these uh, wild vegetables, and uh, therefore they, in, in, in recent years, you know, in, in many parts of the world, they've started uh, cultivating the wild vegetables near the big cities, of the markets, often in greenhouses for whole year production, actually. Um, and that was one of the reasons for my trip to Japan. Um, and uh, after the trip, uh, I found this book, which is like this cornucopia too, but it's in Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, luckily, there's uh, an index with the botanical Latin names for everything there, so I can. Uh, so I'm still, to, if anybody knows how to uh, scan and translate Japanese to English so that I can put it into Google Translate, then talk to me afterwards. <laughs> I think it is possible. Um, at the moment, I have to uh, ask various Japanese-speaking uh, Facebook friends to, for, for help in the translation. I'm getting it. It's a, it's a lot of information in here. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so... Let's get on to the first plant, and uh, this is uh, this is hosta, also called uh, blah lilia in Norwegian. One of the most popular garden plants we have. Very very hardy. We can grow it more or less up over the whole country. Um, and if you think about it, the big leaved hostas they have a huge amount of uh, leaf production every year. So if you realise that uh, well, this is actually food and it's not just an ornamental plant that you have in your garden, then you suddenly have a huge uh, crop to pick every year. Because hostas, uh, uh, all hostas are actually edible. There are no known uh, um, uh, poisonous substances in, in, in hostas. So if you're sure it's a hosta, then you can safely eat it in the springtime. It actually took me many years before I dared to try it because uh, you know, there have been written quite a lot of books about uh, oriental vegetables right away from the 1970s, but for some reason they missed hosta in these books. So as far as I know, um, my book <coughs> uh, uh, is the first which really um, discusses hosta for food in, uh, in, in the West. And uh, it's basically the, um, uh, the main part that you harvest is the young shoots before the... Uh, the leaves begin folding out. You can take all the young shoots, if you wish, and it will reshoot and flower in the same season. So you'll still have the, uh, the ornamental aspect. So this is a real, fantastic, productive edimental. And as I say, it took me many years before I dared to try it. And what actually got me to try it eventually was that I, um, in North America they have uh, a big society the American Hosta Society. 
with uh, 20,000 members. And there are 20,000 different types of foster as well, different uh, cultivars, mainly grown for the leaves, which are often variegated and they look very attractive. And hosta is grown also in, often in very shady conditions. Hosta doesn't need any sunlight at all in the season. Um, not direct sunlight, anyway. Um, and they, the American Hosta Society, they had an annual meeting with a big dinner, and one of their number knew about Hosta for food. And they prepared various dishes for the, um, for the people at this, uh, this uh, big uh, meeting. And afterwards, uh, the, the comments were put out on their website, so people were commenting, well, that was, that was really surprisingly tasty, you know, etc., etc. <laughs> And, and then I dared try, because I saw these people really liked the taste and uh, other people were trying it, so I, I tried. I was expecting some kind of bitterness, but actually I never detected bitterness in, uh, in hosta. Very mild, good taste. You can use it uh, raw, you can also use it uh, as a kind of a spinach. Um, you can also use the flowers. In Japan, they have a special variety. And it's mainly the large-leaved hostas, hosta sigoliana, hosta montana, which are used mm -hmm. just because of their size, their volume, they're more productive. And hosta montana, they have, uh, they, they blanch in, uh, in darkened greenhouses for, for the markets, blanching, so keep the sunlight away, so they just they move the roots into the greenhouses, and then in, in the darkness, the, the young shoots grow up almost totally white. Here I've just used, this is from my garden, and I've had, I just had a bucket over it from the very early spring. And they call these uh, literally hosta icicles, east topper, because they're, they're white. This one's not totally white. I'll show you another picture in a minute. One of the first dishes I made is inspired by, you, know, you can find lots of uh, recipes on the net these days, if you look for hosta and, and recipe. Um, this was just... Uh, cooked off the leaves very, very, very quickly, and then it was marinated in a um, sesame oil, soy sauce, um, a little salt mix, and it's delicious. <laughs> Used as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a salad. Um, there are many recipes. You can also use the, uh, um, the flower stalk. It's really crispy tasting. Um, of course, then you don't get the flour. Um, and then when I, I wrote an article about hosta in Permaculture magazine, again about, about eight years ago now, and uh, I made a comment that uh, the guy that has this garden here um, has the biggest forest garden in the UK. You know who owns this place? The Sorry? The Queen. Not the Queen. <laughs> Related? Charles. Prince Charles. Prince Charles, yeah. This is Prince Charles' uh, um, forest garden at Highgrove in the UK. Well. When I wrote the article, he didn't realise this at the time, that he had, the, uh, had this, the biggest forest garden in the UK, but he's very into organic, everything's grown organically there without pesticides or anything. Fantastic. And he supported the organic movement in the UK right from the beginning. Um, but within this forest here, he has the national collection of large-leaved hostas. So that wood there is absolutely full of food. Um, <coughs> And two years ago, I, I, I did a talk for the UK Walled Garden Society. Do you know what a walled garden is? Uh, it's like, uh, um, you know, all the big houses in the UK, they have a big, a huge wall <coughs> around the, where they grow the vegetables to make for a better climate. Um, anyway, there's a society um, that meet every year, and I was invited to give a talk, and I mentioned the prince, and uh, this, I showed exactly this picture here. And um, little did I know that uh, two of Prince Charles's gardeners were actually in the audience. <laughs> so they came up to me afterwards, and I, I very quickly signed a book and said, "Give it to the prince. You know, <laughs> if he wants to know anything about growing, you know, using hosta for food, then please contact me." Um, so it ended up uh, last summer. I was invited to Highgrove to to talk to the uh, to the head gardener and uh, one of the one of the uh, chefs. Um, about uh, um, about growing uh, about using hosta in the, in, the, in the kitchen. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to take any pictures. It's a high security area, so uh, um, the, uh, but I did find, I think, uh, one which shows what it looks like in there. Is that? No. Yeah, here you can see this is a picture. It's called the, um, um, the scrubbery, I think it's called. Um, it's basically large rotting trunks, and in between there are all these uh, huge cluster plants growing, all different, all different types. Fascinating to look at. Um, and then uh, I was in Japan, and uh, right enough, all the supermarkets I visited there had hosta for sale. This was the end of April, beginning of uh, sorry, the end of March, the beginning of April. And this, this is the the blanched uh, ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be a slightly sweeter taste, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, and and also the way the food looks is very important for the Japanese. So it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So they're into flowers as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so very popular food there. Um, yeah, pop over next one. Um, there is one confusion species, which is a confusion species if you're picking hosta from nature in Japan, in the Far East. Um, Nusarut, or um, it's called false hellebore in English, um, Baratrum, um, can be confused quite easily with uh, hosta if you're, not, if you're not thinking. And this is a, a very poisonous plant, so you've got to be aware. And Baratrum is actually, uh, we have a Norwegian species which grows in Finnmark. Um, and, uh, but it's actually quite easy to tell the difference um, from the leaves. Um, Veratrum, if you look at the nerves of the leaves, they go all the way from the tip right down to the base. With hosta, they just go part of the way. You see? So be absolutely sure that it's uh, hosta. If you're going, because sometimes Nusa root or, or Veratrum is actually grown as an ornamental in Norwegian gardens. So you could potentially um, make a nasty error if you pick the wrong thing. Okay? <coughs> the first time I, I, um, I asked my family to, uh, to be guinea pigs and, and, try, and try hosta for the first time, and we made uh, one of the dishes that they actually made at this big hosta meeting in the US was what they call hosta capita. Now, spano capita is spinach pie, Greek spinach pie. You can buy it on all the street corners in Greece. Okay? So I just used a, uh, a spinach pie, a spano capita recipe, you can all find on the net, and replaced the spinach with hosta leaves. And actually, they all ate it and they enjoyed it and said, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have that again. So, and, they survived. and they survived as well, <laughs> importantly. <laughs> and my daughter was very interested in making sushi for a period. This is pasta leaves in, in the sushi from a, a Japanese recipe. There are loads of recipes and ways of using pasta, aren't there? And then we come on to my largest vegetable. And I mentioned that we had this very cold summer two years ago. Um, this was the size that uh, this plant had reached in the middle of June, in the coldest spring ever in, outside of Trondheim. And for most people where I live is the Arctic, you know? <laughs> so they're surprised. This uh, is, I can introduce you to Udo. I have some seeds with me at this one, if anybody's interested in trying Udo. I know that uh, there is one plant already at, uh, in the Hurdal Eco Village. Something called Jorun Copper Board. You know who? You know her? Yeah. She got a plant from me last year and, and, uh, and planted it. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, Udo. Um, it's in the ginseng family, related to ginseng, Aralia cordata. Sometimes the roots of uh, this plant are used as an alternative to ginseng. Um, and uh, as I say, it, it's, it's actually, it's, a, it's a herbaceous, it uh, dies right back every year and grows to 
three metres or more every summer in the few spring, uh, spring months. Um, later on, let's see. Yeah, now first, uh, what we use of it is the, um, the main part that uh, they use in the Far East to the, uh, the spring shoots, which are harvested uh, up to about one metre high. They're about uh, this much in diameter, so they're quite, quite thick. And each plant has up to about 30 of these shoots which you can harvest. I don't harvest them all, maybe, maybe half of them, and let the, let the others uh, so the plant doesn't get to, <coughs> gets to recover. And one of the easiest ways of using it is basically to, basically to, um, to, to cut these shoots off and basically you, um, you peel the outside layer, which is both slightly coarse, or, or yeah, so it's mainly the coarseness. And uh, then it's just chopped up into small pieces like this and eaten raw with a, a, a simple salad dressing. Um, typically, again, sesame oil, roasted sesame seeds, and uh, soy sauce. Very <coughs> simple. Something you can uh, you can uh, you can pick and uh, and uh, serve within half an hour at home. This is what I call fast slow food. <laughs> You always mentioned this makes so much sense in the early spring, mm. you get lots to harvest. Yeah. Does it then make sense to go for fermentation? Yeah, absolutely. It does. This is the way uh, traditional people would uh, would uh, preserve the food, both that and, and drying. Yeah. Yeah, of spring, okay. spring harvest of vegetables. So, um, and the uh, Sami people in Norway, of course, the Laplanders, mm -hmm. they, uh, they did this on a big scale, and I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This shoot you from young leaves? Sorry? This shoot yeah, young leaves? Or? These are young leaves at the top. Yeah. This is the... the, the um, yeah. Are they a sunburn loving plant? Hmm? Are they a sunburn loving plant? Or? No, it's a uh, half shade is the best thing. It's a woodland plant. That's practically all plants in Japan are. So it was covered in forest. I mean. So the wild plants are half shade lovers. Um, so it's that. You can also use the flower <coughs> shoots as a kind of broccoli. A bit later on, they use it in tempura. Um, you know what tempura is? Yeah. And uh, one of the main reasons for my trip to Japan was to, was to visit this place here. Um, one of the most unusual production methods for, uh, for vegetables I've come across is to be found under part of Tokyo. They have a very special type of earth, and they do dig these big caverns underneath, actually up underneath this, uh, this little forest here. They've dug kind of big caverns underneath the soil, and they move the roots of this huge plant down under, under the earth where it's completely dark, and they grow up. It's a almost constant temperature of about 18 centigrade which is uh, recognized to give the highest quality of udo. Now, in Norway, this may be a bit different, it's definitely difficult to do in my garden because I don't have more than 15 centimeters of soil anywhere, or 20 centimeters, and, um, um, and it's over rock, you know, so I can't really dog, dig very deep. But, um, so you have to use something. I, use one, I have used one of these big uh, builder's buckets, Murabete, one of the really big ones. You put it over before the plants start shooting in the early spring, and then, and it grows at an incredible rate in the springtime, and then you see that the bucket is being lifted right up into the sky, and then, then it's time to harvest. Um, but in Japan, the highest quality udo is uh, under, underground. So we went down here, and uh, it was amazing to see. And apparently, I was the first person from the West to request to go down there, and that was difficult actually. Thanks to Facebook, through a, a Japanese guy that I knew in, no, in, in the Netherlands, he called the city clerk in this part of Japan and arranged the tour for me. And I had to get a, a <coughs> translator, you know, interpreter. And uh, but it was, uh, yeah, absolutely fascinating day. On the Tokyo, and a really nice old guy as well, who, uh, whose farm it was. And in restaurants, you see uh, you see udo 
So here is, so this is green ludo, which has a stronger taste, and strong tasting plants are most often used in tempura. The tempura kind of disguises the, the strong taste. Yeah. How do you know that? Uh, well, it's uh, uh, maybe three, four meters, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you saw it as a forest, it's kind of like another layer in the forest garden, under, underground layer. Mm -hmm. Potentially. The green one has quite a strong taste, so some people find it a bit unpleasant. So blanching or keeping the light awake is a, a mild taste. But strong tastes, uh, you know, disguising strong tastes is, uh, is an interesting topic in itself. Like um, salad dressing was originate, originally was used because a lot of the herbs in salads were quite bitter tasting. Yeah. So the oil and the vinegar actually cover your tongue and so that you don't detect the, the bitter taste as strongly. <coughs> but nowadays it's almost superfluous because uh, um, most of our vegetables are, uh, are mild tasting and sweet. You know? So lettuce or salat, salat was originally a, a bitter herb. You know? um, we have rucola, which has become very popular, amazingly, strangely. Um, it became really, really popular. Maybe because we, we have an innate uh, desire for these stronger tastes that we're kind of lacking in today's diet. Um, and chicory as well, sicory, is becoming more and more, more, more popular. Another quite uh, bitter herb. Anyway, I digress. Um, a relation to the uh, same family as the last one is uh, what uh, we call devil's walking stick or angelica tree in England. Almonds or Seastock in, in Norway, which is, uh, um, I was in Harma yesterday and I was staying with a guy who had one of these in his garden, so they're quite hardy. Um, quite uh, frequently grown in uh, southwestern Norway, Stavanger area, etc. Um, it's actually a, a small tree, so it's not a, it's not a herbaceous perennial like um, the last one you do. And uh, this is also hugely important in Japan. They use the young shoots or the young uh, leaves that come out in the very, very early spring. Here is actually udo, very young shoots at so ground level, which are also used in a, in a similar way, often in tempura or in many other dishes. And uh, that was also um, seen in all the, uh, saw, saw that also in all the, um, all the supermarkets, typically like this in the springtime. Taranomi, the name was. Um, so, very popular there. And a very nice tree to have, I think, in a forest garden, in addition to, so this is a, a tree with edible leaves, edible young leaves. And it's called, uh, yeah, of course, it's the reason it's called Devil's Walking Stick, because when it's a young tree, the <coughs> The stem is covered in big thorns, so it's difficult to, to grasp. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. A bit fairly new. Yeah, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're older fairly, so they I've never, never finished with this talk, so uh, yeah. just relax. <laughs> just kick me out when you're finished. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the next one is uh, also is actually from Korea. The story is from Korea. Um, a very important vegetable is an aster. You know the asters as uh, again as ornamentals in our garden. This one isn't very commonly grown in uh, Scandinavia, but uh, it could well be grown because it's a fantastic ornamental plant in the in the autumn when it's look, looking like that in September. It's one of the most beautiful plants in my garden at that time of year. Um, but it's the uh, young shoots again that you, you harvest, hugely important in Korea, and they grow this plant for the markets in the cities because it's uh, previously a, a forage plant, which has become, which is uh, there's a big demand for in, in the cities, and they also dry the leaves and export to the markets in North America. Um, yeah. It's a fantastic plant, and uh, I was actually contacted by a <coughs> Korean woman in Oslo about five, six years ago. Um, she uh, had been 
I think a refugee from Norway, maybe in the Korean War or something from that stage. She'd just recently retired, got a small cabin out in the woods with a little piece of land. And she still remembered when she was living in Korea as a 10 year old, um, going out foraging with her, 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 her grandmother. And uh, one of the plants she remembered was this one here. Um, she'd searched everywhere to try and find seed so that she could grow this and you know, you know how you remember taste way <coughs> back, you know? And uh, she searched everywhere and then suddenly she found uh, this, uh, this strange Englishman up in uh, Trondheim who had, uh, uh, had seed on his seed list because I, I, I mainly get hold of plant material from, from trading on the internet. So I make a seed list every year and that year this plant was, uh, I had seed of this plant on my seed list. And uh, so I sent her seed and uh, yeah, I learned a, a, a lot from her. And uh, she, was, uh, she was so pleased that she knitted these socks for me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that nice? It's my best trade ever, I think. <laughs> um, and other asters around the world in North America, the Native Americans, they used aster -like macrophyllum, the big leaf aster. And we even have one in Europe which has become quite popular and a very common <coughs> plant which you probably all recognize who've been on uh, next to the sea in Norway. This is uh, Strandsjarna in Norwegian um, or um, sea aster um, in English. And it basically, when it's flowering in, from midsummer up until August, it, uh, you see this stripe of, uh, uh, of, of color from the, from the flowers. Um, there are no records, as far as I know, of uh, use of this plant as a food in, in, uh, in Norway. Um, and in around about two, the early 2000s, this, this plant was chosen as the, as the commune of Lomst, the flower of my commune. Um, uh, and uh, I, was, I, was, I was called by the local newspaper, Malvik rather, um, what I thought about the choice of this one as our, as our local flower and is it edible because they knew I had this uh, strange interest in, in, in weird edible plants. I had heard at the time that it was uh, used as a kind of survival food etc but I, as, just to check I, I looked on the internet I did, did a quick search and within a very short space of time I found out that uh, this plant was under um, extensive, uh, it was being researched in several EU projects looking for novel vegetables to, um, to be grown on uh, land which was uh, too salty. And already at that time in the Netherlands, where they have a big problem with salt, salty land, because of the salt water coming in the low, low line, uh, it was already being sold as gourmet food in, in restaurants <coughs> in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Amazing. Um, and nowadays, it's, uh, I believe it's being grown in, in several other areas, um, not only because of the salt water coming in from the sea, but uh, because of intensive agriculture around the world um, and irrigation. The water evaporates and it leaves salt behind. So there's large areas of uh, land, agricultural land, that are too salty to grow the conventional crops. So looking at alternatives which are so-called halophytes or salt tolerant plants and these are plants which often grow on the beaches. <laughs> Another one which is uh, several of you will probably recognize as a, a garden flower in Norway is uh, what we call Nekatunga. This is a, what they call, it's a species Ligularia fisherine from Korea. Also a very important uh, vegetable which is also grown in, in, uh, in glass houses there. The young shoots are eaten for food. Um, later in the summer you get these, uh, these yellow, anybody recognize this as a garden plant? Often found in old gardens in, in Norway. Not this species, um, other species are a bit, this one has a very mild taste, other species can be quite bitter, so don't eat any any old uh, Ligularia on the Katunga. And uh, it's also a woodland plant, and uh, these are just a few pictures of them growing in, for production in, uh, in uh, Korea. 
and uh, they're used in different ways. These here are being, um, being sold as wraps for food. So they have the food up in, in, in the leaf, and the leaves are edible, raw. And here, top right, just used as a, as a vegetable, you can see it's uh, full, of, uh, full of good stuff. It looks a bit like uh, kale or something, you know? very dark. And here's a picture of a wrap as they serve it in, in Japan, in Korea. In the Far East, uh, I, love my, I love my onions. I have maybe 400 different types of onions in my garden. And uh, there is always an onion flowering in my garden, right from the beginning of April to October. Um, a fascinating family huge diversity, and all of them can be eaten, even the ornamental ones. Some of them are a bit strong tasting, um, so if they're too strong, don't bother, but uh, you can try any of them. Uh, in the Far East, it's unlike in, in Europe, where we mo mo mostly um, cultivate uh, um, Allium kepa, kepa lurk in Norwegian, the bulb onion. Uh, in the Far East, it's mainly pepa lurk or Welsh onion, Allium fistulosum, which is grown. And there are many, many, many different uh, varieties. Um, Allium fistulosum originates in Siberia and uh, is a very, very hardy plant originally. Um, here is from a, actually just from a supermarket in, in Japan, eight different varieties of, uh, of this plant. Um, before the last war in Norway actually was uh, People like Welsh onion was uh, was grown on quite a big big scale. About that time, Kepler, I mean Kepler came came to Norway. So before that time, it was shallot and and uh, people like that were grown. Um, <coughs> and there's a huge amount of food in a plant grown as a perennial. So everything there can be used. This is from the botanical gardens in Oslo, mm -hmm. and can be grown more or less anywhere in. In Norway. And we have a really old tradition in Norway um, of growing onions on roofs. <laughs> you know about this? This is good bronze dome around Otta. Um, they, it's just one, there are about uh, eight of these old roofs which still exist and they're all now protected by law. So it's not allowed to go and uh, start <laughs> eating these. <no? laughs> um, but there, um, some of them have come far, are on the way out, unfortunately. but. Uh, um, and they were grown on these roofs both because the leaves are succulent, so it was kind of fire protection, but uh, it had a double role that it could also, they could also be harvested for food in the springtime. And uh, this, uh, this lady here told, told us that uh, um, it, her, her <coughs> grandmother ordered her husband up onto the roof every spring to harvest the, uh, the onions for, the, uh, for a, a scrambled egg, egg of her. And uh, the environment on these roofs is totally extreme. And in fact, you'll find that the, uh, <coughs> the onions, you'll only find them on the south-facing part of the roof. On the other part of the roof, the grasses win the battle. Mm. On the south-facing part, which is driest, warmest, and very cold in winter, potentially, the onions grow. So these are incredibly hardy plants. And they've been growing on these roofs for such a long time that some botanists in Norway think that a new species has actually evolved on these roofs. <laughs> so we can, uh, we can call it uh, Allium goodbrandalensis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just quickly over another one we saw a lot of in uh, production in, uh, in Japan. Japanese parsley, Mitsuba, which you can find in the vegetable catalogues. It's also perennial. Um, it's a very nice red leaf form, um, which uh, I grow in my garden, and it's reliably uh, perennial. The leaves don't taste at all like. Um, it's in also a uh, in the carrot family, like uh, um, like uh, parsley, but the leaves uh, don't taste at all like parsley. So have a completely different taste. Tastes to me a bit like sushi or something, you know, something Japanese. <laughs> so perfect to that. Okay, we go on. Wasabi, we've already talked about, so I won't dwell on that. 
getting behind on time here. And uh, I did actually grow wasabi in my garden for six years, and this was the total crop I managed to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was delicious. Great to have a Malvik wasabi one year. Um, did it perish? It's hardy, and you can also use the leaves and the flowers. They're very tasty as well. But the plant, did it collapse? Did it just... It, one collapse? year it did, uh, it did die. I'm not sure if it was because I'd harvested the root. <laughs> Possibly. But, uh, yeah. but it, they are quite hardy. And they're actually... Um, normally they're, they're grown in... We visited a wasabi farm. In, and they're grown in running water, literally. But there are dry land forms of wasabi also. So it's worth trying to get hold of one of them if you want to try it. But it has very, very narrow ecological... Um, conditions that are perfect for its for producing the roots. Like the water has to be about 13, 14 centigrade the whole year. So it's spring water <coughs> from the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, they can lurk roots. And uh, they're, it's, uh, it's related to lurk roots. Yeah. Um, or hedge garlic, as it's called, aliari. Um, aliari, that plant is, uh, is uh, annual whereas this is a, a perennial. Yeah, and that's what the roots are supposed to look like <laughs> under proper conditions. And you can also find the, uh, the leaf shoots being sold as food in supermarkets. Uh, and it, as, as you mentioned, it's not wasabi. If you've been to a sushi restaurant and had wasabi paste, it's nothing to do with wasabi. But it's a very expensive production. So they use horseradish and mustard and food coloring to make it look like. So you're fooled. Yeah. And then we have um, this one here. If you can't beat it, eat it. Um, Parks of the or Japanese uh, knotweed, is a hugely invasive plant, blacklisted plant in, in Norway. In, uh, it's called, uh, in uh, Japan, it's called Itadori, which literally means the strong one. Because it can break its way through asphalt, for example. Um, but uh, it's a lot of negative things are written about this plant, but it's actually a fantastic uh, edible. Yeah? Can your plant finish it? No. Oh, could, uh, okay. uh, it's, a, it's a really tall plant, which can grow to three, four meters in, in the summer. And... Uh, some people call it bamboo, so it kind of looks a bit like bamboo. Um, but it's uh, <coughs> on the Norwegian blacklist, plant you're not allowed to, you shouldn't plant, or it's unwanted and leaves a lot of roundup on it, etc. But uh, don't do that, eat it instead. If we ate more of it, then it wouldn't be such a problem. And in fact, uh, um, it, the, um, you, you harvest them about this stage, you can use them just like uh, rhubarb and use them in the same dishes they use rhubarb in, as a kind of a slightly lemony paste. And, uh, but, um, uh, or you can just use it as a vegetable. And it contains a, a well-known antioxidant called uh, resveratrol, if I say that correctly, um, which uh, is apparently um, the same antioxidant you find in red wine. So if you make a Japanese knotweed pie, and then have a glass of red wine next to you, you're guaranteed to live to 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking, but uh, it's uh, actually, this plant is, is grown commercially to, um, to produce uh, resveratrol, this antioxidant, which is sold internationally in the markets. And this is the distribution of it in Norway. So we're not going to get rid of it. It's here for here to stay. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, it seems to be more common here that it, I didn't see it actually that much in Japan. Um, <laughs> saw it a few places, but uh, that's it. And uh, almost finished now with Japan. Um, we have um, street sieving or ostrich fern in English. Um, oh, I see what's uh, happening. Yeah, the slides are slightly different because I've made some last minute differences and I'm running off this stick, which was an earlier version. Never mind. Um, but ostrich fern uh, yeah, has become known. Many people here have eaten ostrich fern. Actually, quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, ostrich fern is uh, Norway's largest fern. Um, it can be higher than me under where it grows in good conditions, and it often forms really large stands. It spreads vegetatively, so that uh, what you see is thousands of plants can actually just be one plant, um, so they're connected by rhizomes. Um, you have to be absolutely certain that it is ostrich fern, so it's good to go out with somebody who knows, knows their plants, because it can be confused with uh, poisonous ferns. Um, but uh, ostrich fern is, uh, has traditionally been used around the world, um, both in uh, Japan, in the Far East, um, also in uh, North America. It was a Native American vegetable, which the Europeans learnt, and uh, today something like 1,000 tons of, uh, of these very small so-called fiddleheads are harvested in the springtime and, and sold as gourmet food. The taste is excellent, a bit like a mixture of beans and various other, other vegetables, a bit distinctive, but everybody I know that's tried it have, have loved it. Important to cook for about 15 minutes because often where you collect them are along rivers which flood in the winter and flood waters can bring with them some nasties. So make sure you cook for 15 minutes, but the taste is still, still great after that time. Um, also, often grown as, a, as, an, as, a, um, as an ornamental in gardens around the world. And uh, it's a rather stately looking plant. And it's important, uh, one very important to character of it to, uh, compared with other ferns, that it has two different types of leaf. It has these very large summer leaves which are, are green. There are no spores behind the leaves. And uh, there are secondary, smaller leaves, which are about this high, which you don't see in the summer. They're hidden by the big green leaves, which are dark, and they're covered in spores. And these stand over the entire winter, and then the spores are released in the springtime with the floodwaters, etc. When it's, uh, the snow's melting, etc. So that's a, there are, this is the only one you're likely to find in this area with, with uh, two different uh, leaves like this. So get to know it before you try it. Distribution in Norway. In fact, Norway has uh, even larger stands of ostrich fern in North America. Um, despite that, it's until recent years, it's, it's hardly anybody that has known it as a medical plant. And traditionally, we, we only have one record of ferns being eaten for food back in, I think, in the 16th century or something. So huge amount of footage and it grows right the way to the far north so it's a very very hardy plant and again in Japan in the supermarkets every supermarket had ostrich ground for sale very popular <coughs> okay shall we hop over Malva Alf Alpha we had uh, Alf Alpha sprouts for breakfast but actually the plant itself, which is lucerne, um, which uh, is well known as probably the world's uh, um, most important fodder crop for animals, is actually used as a perennial vegetable also in, for humans in, uh, in China. So you can actually grow lucerne in Norway as a perennial, and you can harvest the young shoots in the springtime. There's the sprouts. There's the sprouts we had at uh, Barrett's place for breakfast. <laughs> hmm? uh, no, yes, yeah, yeah, that. yeah it's a uh, yeah, it's a uh, pea family, yes. So it's uh, very good for that as well. But it's difficult to produce the, the seeds, unfortunately. I had beans. Did I have? Apparently, it needs a special, special insect. A special insect which mm -hmm. does the pollination, so which they introduce where they, they're producing the seeds. Mm. Uh, and then we have uh, yeah, garlic chives, which is also very important in the Far East, another beautiful autumn flowering mm -hmm. onion, which I won't go into into detail. You can also use, you can find uh, this is actually bought in a Chinese uh, supermarket in Oslo. 
there are certain varieties which are, are bred for succulent flower stalks, which are used in food. And then we have uh, daylily, which is another very important, uh, well, along with hosta, probably the number two, as far as the uh, most popular uh, most popular ornamental plants in the world, again with uh, tens of thousands of uh, varieties. Um, and, uh, but this is actually one of the oldest vegetables that are known going back uh, several thousand years in China, used as a food plant. And uh, it's both, uh, both the young leaves in the springtime, but uh, mainly the uh, flower buds. The flowers can be used in salad, uh, as long as you don't uh, eat 40, 50 of them, in which case you might get a, a bad stomach, but uh, in small amounts you can use the flowers in the salads. <laughs> and actually the day after the flowers, they uh, come out, they, they uh, wither, and you c they collect the withered flowers, dry them, and use them as a kind of a, uh, uh, a, a uh, use them in, in soups as a flavoring. Uh, during the winter months. So here you have a plant where you can enjoy the flower and also harvest. It's quite nice. Um, may, it's mainly the uh, simple yellow varieties which are grown in, in the Far East. Um, and these, are, these have very big flowers, as you can see. So they're quite productive. And uh, This is a daylily farm in Taiwan. This could be Norway if we wanted to, it's a totally hardy plant. And uh, you'll have a picture from the Botanical Garden in Oslo, where they've kindly put out snacks besides the <laughs> 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 In the woodlands in uh, Japan, you see Heverocallis or Daylily growing everywhere. It's very early spring, so no flowers, of course. So this is all food. See there. <coughs> yeah, I think I just pass over these few here because we're going to run out of time. Just show you these Japanese water drop works, seri, very important. Uh, yeah. Is it time for a pause? Japanese uh, Japan pest root, the fuki, super important vegetable in Japan. You also see in all the supermarkets. Um, they use both the flower buds and the uh, flower stems. This is an invasive plant in Norway, which is uh, uh, this is an invasive plant in Norway, which is found uh, um, in various parts of Norway, escaped from gardens. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just a few pictures showing it being used. Oh, you don't see the pictures at all. Sorry about that. <laughs> From the other side, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, Yeah, and this last one was uh, one well, of the last days I was in Japan. I was in a soba restaurant, which is a buckwheat pasta restaurant, which are very you find all over Japan. And this is a very special one because he was growing all these vegetables in his garden around the restaurant. So this garden here was full of uh, um, edibles, including uh, oster shoots. Orcus nella, you know this? Yeah. Equisatum, very popular vegetable there. They use a lot. Um, again, you see that in all the supermarkets. And the big surprise, the one that I really, the <coughs> most extreme vegetable I, I ate there was actually a, a um, elder, hmm. Sambucus wow. hoon. <coughs> this was a red berried hoon, and they were actually eating the leaves and the, the flowers. Wow. Um, I survived. <laughs> yeah, so I guess so. But I thought I thought the green leaves were also quite uh, a bit toxic, but obviously not as much as I think. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, the flowers you can, but it was the it was the leaves, the green leaves, that I was a bit surprised at. Yeah. Okay, shall we take a, a little break? Happy so far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>